big themes this year at Davos is artificial intelligence. Machines are beginning to drive cars. They're beginning to understand us and speak to us, not perfectly. They're beginning to see better than humans can. This is a big shift for humanity and the economy. We're creating more wealth than ever before. More millionaires, more billionaires. Uh, GDP is an all-time high. But at the same time, a lot more people are being left behind. Median income, that's the income at the 50th percentile, is lower now in the United States and other advanced countries than it was back in the year 2000. So at least half the population isn't participating in all this wondrous wealth that's being created. And that's creating challenges. And we've seen in the recent elections that a lot of people are angry about that. They feel like the system isn't working for them. And it's not just the disenfranchised. I wondered if a robot's going to take my job. I don't think a robot will ever take your job. Thank goodness. <laughs> but people are very concerned about it. It's very much in the zeitgeist. We think 2017 is the year that artificial intelligence goes mainstream. And people are concerned because you look at games of intellect. When the machine can win at chess, when it can beat any human at Go, um, that is a real concern to folks. When we look in the paralegal business, that artificial intelligence platforms can easily out-execute a crack team of paralegals at a white shoe law firm. In radiology, uh, I think in 10 years it'll be malpractice if you go to a human radiologist because we see the machine, like with mammography, has more than a 99% accuracy, whereas you know one out of five humans will actually make a mistake in that process. So when people think that through, they start to think, is the machine gonna start to eat white collar work? And what does that mean to me? It's a big, big issue. So what are the positives? How's it gonna help me? Here's what Kathy Basant from Bank of America told me about how she was gonna put consumer and market data to work. Well, we might watch the transactions that you do with us. We might understand um, your payment history. We could see that you bought an airline ticket to go to a particular destination. We can put all of that together for you to help prevent fraud. Um, we can help you have um, uh, at your fingertips information mm -hmm. about the, the kinds of transactions you might want to think about. If a balance is getting low and we know you're going to be an active user because you're traveling. Mm -hmm. you know, not, the, not the kind of insights that cross the creepy line, mm -hmm. but the kind of insights that really add value to you in ways that you might not even know would be helpful. The distributed power that eBay gives its users is enhanced by AI. Here's what Dan Tarman told me. We are utilizing artificial intelligence to help create a more personalized shopping experience for people. How do you do that? So we use uh, algorithms so that we can help someone uh, be we can help better understand what a buyer might want by their behavior patterns on our mm -hmm. platform. And that means that we can better match someone that's supplying something, mm -hmm. a seller, to someone that's looking for something. AI is already bursting onto the scene in health. Fabian Beckers is bringing medical imaging and AI together to help doctors better diagnose patients. So uh, in the case of the heart, uh, the heart is a pump. It has mm -hmm. two main chambers, two main mm -hmm. ventricles, and doctors have to basically uh, draw contours mm -hmm. to segment those chambers, understand how much they're pumping each time. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of manual work. Mm -hmm. um, and here, deep learning can basically by itself find those ventricles and quantify them for the doctor so he doesn't have to do it. So half an hour to an hour work, now it's fully automated. And there's no doubt that the stakes are high. Here's Stuart Russell from the University of California at Berkeley. But the general problem, you know, we might call it the King Midas problem. You ask an intelligent machine to do something and it takes you very literally, it does exactly what you say, and then you regret it, right? Mm -hmm. And we only have one human race, we don't get to have a do-over. Right. Um, so the, the big question is how do you get machines to behave in a way that's guaranteed not to make you unhappy? Uh, particularly when you actually don't know uh, what you really want and you don't mm -hmm. know what's gonna make you unhappy. Um, so getting the field to agree there's a problem is the first step. The second step is what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to actually have a mathematical theory of machines that are provably beneficial in the sense that you are provably better off with this machine than without. Um, and it turns out that the key um, to that is that the machine should be explicitly uncertain about what it is that you want. Of course, one of the reasons we're so interested in AI here at Hub Culture is that we're building our own artificial intelligence. Here I am talking to Stan Stalnaker, the founder of Hub Culture, about Zeek.ai. Zeek is what we call an emergent intelligence. So it's an AI, but you know, it's kind of starting out as what we call an EI. And the point of the project is to develop um, a, 
a kind of new entity, a new idea, a new tool, and a new personality to assist hub culture mm -hmm. and the ecosystem in a variety of tasks. 2017 is going to be the year that AI goes mainstream. Let's see what happens. I'm Edie Lush.